Thank, thank you very much. So now we have uh, three presentations open for questions. So, uh, Jose Nelson. I want to ask a question to Patrick to start. Is uh, EMT is probably one of the most studied transitions in cancer these days. We even have several papers on the subject that are interested in it. But very few drugs, although I understand a lot about the process, very few drugs have been actually been effective on doing EMT. What you're proposing on your drug, you're telling me that you become effective because uh, if you become less mesochemio, you're going to have less metastasis, or is another process? Is that where, uh, that's what you say based by slowing, by slowing the mesochemio, you stop metastasis, but you may not stop the primary tumor. Is that what you're trying to say? So the mode of action of antibody is actually to kill um, the more slow, the, the cells that are proliferating slower than the other one. It's, and and it, the fact is that epithelial cells are, are proliferating more than mesenchymal cells, more mesenchymal cells. So we are actually shift, we are not directly affecting EMT. What we are doing is just killing cells. And by killing cells that are proliferating and, in a different and, and, way, we're moving the tumor to a more epithelial phenotype. And what's the target on the epithelial cell? Is that every patient has the same target, or is that just going to apply to a certain group of patients or a group of patients? No, so the target is, the antibody is, is recognizing a target it's called netrin-1. And, and so basically, uh, in, in a fraction of all cancer indications, you have this netrin that is present. So, so, for example, it will be uh, half of lung cancer, it will be uh, two-thirds of ovarian cancer. Most of the patients that are responding so far have what we call uterine cancer, so endometrium and, and squamous cervical, and we don't know why so far. So, I mean, the next step now is actually to understand why some patients are responding and some are not. Uh, whether it's actually linked to this EMT or not, it's not known yet. Beautiful work. Uh, Ada is uh, before you, Vicunha. So I'm sitting next to Michael, and I enjoyed very much what he said, and I agree with him totally. This is actually what happened to me. I wanted to understand how the genetic code is being translated. Now I'm working on antibiotics. Maybe I need 28 years to, in order to get a, a real thing out of it. And thank you very much. Okay, so there was a comment more than. Now Vicuña and then Salvador. Thank you. I have a question for Professor Michael Sella. You mentioned this peptide that develops a myelinization in multiple sclerosis uh, animal models. Has this peptide been tested in animal models of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Has the peptide that works in, with uh, multiple sclerosis been tested in, in animal models of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Because it was such a big success, they tested it for many, even I can tell you for sure it doesn't work. It doesn't work, it's too bad. Can I use and a question to Dr. Malin, because either I didn't hear well enough or I didn't understand. Can you tell us more about netrin or about the other drug, or is it a secret? You mean more about netrin? So netrin is actually a, 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 a factor that was identified back in, in 19, late 90s by Marc tessier as a guidance cue, some things that has, was attracting axons. And, and basically now it's known to play many roles, and, and one of these roles is actually to be re-expressed in cancer and, and to uh, inhibit uh, cell death mediate, mediated by these receptors. Thank you. You said that you were going to combine this therapy now with uh, some other cancer therapies, and you mentioned several. What is the rationale for choosing one or the other to combine with this? I mean, what is guiding your, uh, your thought about uh, combinations? 
So, the, I mean, the idea for combination is that uh, there is more and more both uh, basic, I mean, we were mentioning that EMT is a big thing now, so there is more and more papers actually showing that the more mesenchymal you are, the less sensitive you will be to chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And so the idea is that because our antibody is moving the tumor to a more epithelial phenotype, we should resensitize uh, two different types of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And basically, we've been tested uh, plenty of different chemotherapy, uh, carbotaxol, 5-FU, and it, in each case, basically, there is a poten potentialization of the combination. So the idea would be to combine first with chemotherapy. So in indication, clinical indication, where we have been seeing effect in monotherapy, so basically uterine cancer, and then we will combine with immunotherapy, uh, more in lung cancer and head and neck cancer, because here we have some preclinical data that support that if we combine, we have better effect. There is increasing evidence that uh, radiotherapy might be acting through activating the immune system yeah. in the right way. Why not with radiotherapy? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, for sure, combining with radiotherapy would make a lot of sense. Uh, there is actually some papers saying that netrin-1 is upregulated after radiotherapy, uh, but we cannot do everything. You know, we are a small... Uh, research lab, we cannot turn a small yeah, clinical Precisely, lab. that's why I'm asking, which is the first choice and why? So the first, I mean, it will, be, it will start in 2019, so in three months from now, basically it will be combo with chemotherapy, carbotaxol in uterine cancer, and, and combo with uh, uh, PDL1 uh, in uh, head and neck and, and lung cancer. Thank you. Okay, now Hans. No, thank you. So as a non-specialist in this field, I nevertheless take the liberty to ask two questions. So the first one is for Professor Gachobori. So you mentioned genomics as a service and referring to mobility as a service. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit because there are clearly differences between mobility and genomics. And the second one is maybe it has a bearing on the next section we will have on the session number nine, Future Science Policy because uh, Professor Seller was referring to curiosity driven, driven on discovery. But what is driving curiosity? That would be an interesting question, no? because it's not a human constant or evolutionary one. So curiosity is also being shaped uh, by whatever it is, and it would be interesting to close the loop, actually. Okay. That's a very, very important question. Thank you so much. The first question is what uh, kind of genome as services? And as I said, that the mobility is not only the car services, not driving the, the car but, uh, for passengers, but uh, as an information system, it itself, as a system, it's a services. So therefore, uh, my intention to explain like uh, genome as services means genome sequencing itself or like uh, monitoring itself, metagenomics itself. More, I would like to say the system, whole system like, like uh, personalized medicine or point of care or uh, monitoring for seawater conditions. I think we have to think as a system. And the system itself has kind of a value. And it might give new industry. I think uh, that's why I would say, as a system, we have to think of that. Second question is very, very important, I think, this meeting. And how basic science can be transformed to beneficial things to the society. But as we know, also, as Dr. Uh, Sela mentioned, if we go from, from the beginning, you know, just looking for kind of application, usually it doesn't last. But uh, I think a curiosity-oriented uh, research would give have variety of field and the definition of breakthrough is not predictable thing. I, I think unpredictable thing, we call it breakthrough. Therefore, I would say variety of research is tremendously important. 
actually natural selection in the evolutionary, evolutionary theory of organisms give us very good lesson. I think variety would be the source of new species. So therefore, I think really we want to have an innovation, really transforming important role of uh, based science. I think curiosity-oriented research should be the most important thing. That's what I think. I, I want to say only that Aristotle said the same in the beginning of the metaphysics. So uh, the last question, Onoshik. I just want to make a comment about uh, Professor Selatok. I was, I think it was a very inspiring presentation showing basically they completely changed the field on the area of creating pretty much the problem protein folding that I, I made a career out of it many years later. But the idea that you can learn a lot of biology by doing in vitro studies that you don't have to do in vivo by understanding the folding of the proteins isolation, bring that, and uh, I think that's a very important thing that help us a lot on designing of new drugs and understanding protein folding, understanding how to design proteins these days. And I want to say to these people that it's amazing that his 1961 paper with Empson on the folding of ribonuclease is still a base paper that's taught in every class of biophysics that you teach until today, and that was really a transformative change in the science of proteins. <laughs>